as a reminder, uh, Munson Healthcare hosts these weekly press conferences to keep you up to date on all of the latest uh, COVID-19 information happening in Northern Michigan. Uh, there are other ways that you can stay connected with information through Munson Healthcare. Uh, we invite you to uh, sign up for our e-newsletter that's sent approximately every two weeks. Uh, we invite you to follow us on social media and also uh, visit MunsonHealthcare.org where we have a comprehensive list of FAQs and information related to COVID-19, visitor restrictions, and uh, vaccine uh, questions. Next slide, please. So joining us today will be uh, Dr. Christine Nepsey, who's the Chief Medical Officer of Munson Healthcare, Wendy Hershenberger, the Health Officer for Grand Rivers County Health Department, Dr. Jennifer Morse, Medical Director for District Health Department Number 10, and I'm Diane Mihalik, the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Munson Healthcare, and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, um, I just want to remind everyone that we will have a Q&A session after our panelists uh, share their updates. If you are on the Zoom call itself, you can submit your questions through the Q&A feature, and I encourage you to submit them as you think of them. Uh, if you are watching this uh, live streaming, you can uh, also submit your questions via Facebook, and they will reach me. We'll get to as many questions as possible uh, at the end of today's session. Uh, so as usual, we like to begin these press conferences with uh, an update from Dr. Christine Nepsey. So Dr. Nepsey, the last time we met uh, was about two weeks ago on March 23rd. And at that time, our positivity rate was uh, approximately 11%. It's now 16% today. And our hospitalized patients were um, around 53. Um, and as I can as you can imagine, a lot has changed in two weeks. Um, so could you please walk us through what our current numbers are? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Diane. So as we have been reporting the last few weeks, we continue to see a pretty steep rise in our percent positive in our community. And then as a result of that, in our number of hospitalizations. So you can see here the raw numbers for the state as well as the region of uh, both our cumulative cases as well as deaths. Um, I would like to uh, point you to that last um, square there at the bottom of the slide that uh, shows our percent positivity. So on a rolling two week average, we're at 15.2%. You know, last week we were at 10.7 um, and 16% as Diane pointed out. Additionally, we are at 638 cases per 100,000. Um, that rate, that 15.2% and 16% is the highest we've seen uh, during this pandemic. Next slide. So as I reported, these are our raw numbers um, for our inpatients. Um, as we have seen a rise in our community cases, we have also seen a rise in our number of COVID positive inpatients. You'll move to the next slide. Here you can really see a graphic representation of where that is. And again, we, we um, are seeing new highs in our numbers, which is of course um, concerning. Next slide. There is some good news here. Uh, what this graphic shows you is there's really a, a, a inverse uh, relationship between um, age and vaccination and the hospitalizations. So this new surge in cases is really being driven by our younger population. Um, we are seeing younger numbers uh, or younger ages of people being hospitalized additionally. Uh, so when we look at the vaccination rate um, here, you can really see that the people that are being hospitalized are those that are not immunized. And in fact, the state did release some new information. Uh, when you look at this surge statewide and how many people who have been vaccinated that are hospital, that is at 4.6 cases per 100,000. Uh, if you compare that to people who are not immunized, that rate is at 345 per 100,000. So a significant difference uh, between being vaccinated and not vaccinated. Next slide. So again, you can see here our cumulative numbers. Um, again, some of the highest we've seen throughout this pandemic that is statewide, um, but also here in our Northern Michigan region. Next slide. 
when we look at our um, vaccinations, these are the state numbers here. You can see uh, we have uh, immunized millions of Michiganders and have a decent uh, percent coverage. If you'll go to the next slide, you can see here, <clears throat> excuse me, how well we're doing in northern Michigan. So over 43% coverage with vaccine, which is good news. I, I shudder to think what we would be if we hadn't, you know, for our hospitalizations, if we hadn't had um, that, that breadth of coverage. Um, so our role in this, Munson Healthcare has provided um, close to 60,000 doses of vaccine, uh, not only through our mass vaccination clinics, but also in our allocation to our uh, clinics around our region, uh, both employed as well as independent and in our collaboration with our local health departments. That work will continue um, as we continue to try to get as much vaccine out. Uh, we continue to see the federal government allocating vaccine to our retail pharmacies, um, and then the state is allocating to our health departments, our practices, our hospitals and health centers. And again, the state is using a social vulnerability index and in trying to ensure that those folks who are at higher risk uh, for COVID-19 or at high risk for not having access to healthcare um, get prioritized and uh, we ensure that they have access to the vaccine as well. Next slide. I think people are aware um, as of the 5th, we are open to everybody who is eligible for the vaccine. So uh, the Pfizer vaccine is um, for 16 and up. The Johnson and Johnson and Moderna vaccine are 18 and up, but basically, um, we are open to all Michiganders who are eligible to get the vaccine now, which is great news and, and a little bit earlier than we had originally thought we would do. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. Next slide. Um, some of the news that has recently uh, changed is the duration of quarantine. So you may recall that we had um, earlier on with direction from both the CDC as well as the state uh, lowered a little bit um, with testing and some other things, the duration of time you needed to quarantine. Because of the increasing case rates, as well as um, the frequency of variant we are seeing in Michigan, we have reinstated that 14 day quarantine for close contacts of people with COVID-19. If you are fully vaccinated, um, there is not a requirement for vaccine after exposure, although we would definitely recommend people continue the safety measures of uh, masking in public and um, hand washing and social distancing. And we do also recommend that you keep your COVID-19 vaccine card um, readily available uh, both with you and uh, take a picture of it on your phone. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different ways that you can keep track of that, but um, it, that could have become important for you to be able to show proof of your vaccine. Next slide. All right, I will hand it back over to you, Diane, for the update from our health departments. Great, thank you, Dr. Nefsi. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Wendy Kirschenberger uh, from the Grand Traverse County Health Department. And just as a reminder, not have uh, video capability, but we're excited to have her join us and uh, give us an update. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so for Grand Traverse County right now, um, our update is that all of our metrics are rising uh, and have been rising fairly rapidly over the last month. Our current seven day average of cases per day is 39. Um, and so we're starting to see the numbers like we were in late November and early December. Um, with that has come prioritization of cases statewide. So focusing really on those uh, younger, uh, those who can't be vaccinated yet or who haven't been vaccinated yet, but particularly those in school age kids. Um, in March, 20% of our cases in our county were of the 0 to 19 population, and just during the last week, we've had 43 school age cases um, that were in the process of, of doing case investigations and contact tracing on. Uh, also, within the last 30 days, 76% uh, of our cases have been in those under 50 years of age, so this really uh, kind of reinforces the message Dr. Nefsi was talking about how uh, vaccination 
really is uh, making a uh, positive um, impact on those who've, who have been vaccinated as far as those who are getting ill. Um, our percent positivity over the last month rose from 3.6% to 11.4%. Again, this was similar to what we were seeing back in uh, late November. And uh, both last week and this week, uh, the state has identified two cases of the B117 variant in Grand Traverse County residents. So we were just notified of the recent two uh, yesterday that the, the testing uh, for the variant came through. So we will be uh, following up and doing more intense uh, case investigations on those. Um, and really our message right now is with the numbers that we're seeing is to get tested. Um, it's easily accessible. Uh, we do know that we had a, a very good turnout yesterday at uh, Central High School. I don't have the final numbers yet. Um, the school and the state uh, coordinated that test, but I, I do know that they were um, anticipating somewhere over 700 uh, by the end of the day, and they did have to cut it off just because there were so many people in line. Um, we are also in the process of um, mobilizing some satellite vaccination clinics. Uh, we continue our, our daily efforts of the mass vaccination site at NMC's Haggerty Center, but in addition, we are uh, planning to get out to other parts of the county. Our first clinic is coming up is at Fife Lake Township Hall. It's on April 16th and it's from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, the township is uh, helping to coordinate that clinic and uh, there's information on, on how to contact them if you live out in that area. Uh, as uh, Dr. Nefsi said, anybody 16 or older is now eligible for the vaccine. So we are fortunate at our, um, that the pr prominent vaccine that we've been getting is the Pfizer vaccine because that is the only one that's approved for the, the 16 plus. Um, I will say that if you're, uh, under 18 years and do uh, want to come to NMC's Haggerty Center for vaccination that you have to be accompanied by a parent or guardian um, at that site. And also that we have a survey that you can get in the queue and save your spot. Uh, that's at gtcountycovid19.com slash vaccine. Next slide, please. So as far as uh, vaccine distribution, uh, this week we will administer um, close to 3,200 total doses, uh, a mix of uh, first and second doses. Um, the cumulative number of vaccines that we've administered uh, through our vaccine clinics uh, through yesterday are a total of 31,100 doses, um, with over 17,000 of those being the initial first dose. And then I just wanted to highlight some of the vaccine coverage rates for Grand Traverse County specifically. Uh, this is from the state's dashboard. Um, but if you look at the second column, it's the initiation. So that is people who've received their, their first shot. Um, and you can see that in the 65 and uh, older population that we're doing uh, very well. Uh, we're at 80, almost 89% for the 75 plus. And for that population, we're continuing to work with some of our partners in the community, uh, particularly those who are homebound to get them vaccinated. Um, those who are unable to come to the clinic, uh, 65 uh, to 74, we're at 82.3%, and then making good progress on the 50 to 64 year olds as well at 53%. And then uh, as we start to work to the, the younger age groups, uh, we're continuing to see those numbers uh, slowly rise, which is also a good indication. Overall, uh, we're at a 49.1% uh, coverage rate for initial vaccine for Grand Traverse County. So that's my update for today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Wendy. And again, uh, we appreciate all of these updates and we appreciate all of the hard work that you and your team are doing to get these vaccinations done as you continue your work on contact tracing and in, in case investigation. So we know how challenging uh, that's been. So again, we appreciate uh, you being available for uh, this press conference to give us this update.
right, next slide, please. Um, next, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jennifer Morse um, from District Health Department number 10. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Morse. And uh, I imagine the story is, is very similar uh, in your district as well. It is. Um, we are seeing cases increasing quite dramatically as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of very rapidly growing large outbreaks. We've had a lot of identified uh, B117 variants. Um, I just pulled those numbers. We've had 12 identified in Wexford County, um, eight in Missaukee County, um, four in Roscommon County, six in Kalkaska, and then one in some various other counties. So we know there's a lot more than that. And some of those counties with larger numbers, um, we've seen some very big, rapidly developing um, outbreaks. And you know that is one of the main reasons why we've gone to 14 days across the board for our quarantine. Um, we have seen cases that have developed on day 11 or beyond of, of um, exposure. So people have already left quarantine and have exposed others and caused spread of illness. So there is a rationale behind that. Uh, we have, ex we have um, administered nearly 70,000 doses of vaccine um, in our 10 counties. Uh, we continue to hold regular vaccination clinics. Um, we are working to utilize our Johnson & Johnson vaccine primarily in our um, unique populations where one dose vaccine is more logical, like our homebound populations or jails and shelters. Um, there are some new clinics that have been set up for our university settings. And so for us, that would be Ferris State University. Um, we are and have been vaccinating our 16 plus uh, population. We started that a little ahead of schedule uh, from the state. And just like with Grand Travers, we do need a parent or guardian to register those individuals and to accompany them uh, per state law. And those links are on our website, the COVID-19-vaccine link that is there on our page. Um, I just want to stress, it is really important that people still focus on getting tested as well. Our percent positivities are quite high. Uh, the number of tests that people are getting done is about the same. And so I just want to remind people that if you have any symptoms at all that could be COVID, to make sure you get tested. Um, if you present for testing and it's not offered to you, ask for it. Um, if you've been exposed, present for testing about five to seven days after you've been exposed. Um, really, our, our main tools right now still are trying to identify illness and close contacts and quarantining to prevent spread. Um, as Wendy said, we are getting really overwhelmed with the number of cases. And especially now we're trying to vaccinate, so our staff is really stretched thin. And so if you know that you are infected with COVID as much as you feel comfortable, please try to contact your close contacts, let them know that they need to quarantine and then yourself make sure that you isolate. And all the information on how to do that is on the michigan.gov slash coronavirus website and also on the CDC website. And absolutely, if you have questions, they'll give us a call. Uh, but again, we ask like we did back in November, you know, as much as you feel comfortable, try to take the initiative rather than waiting for a call from the state or from the health department. Um, I believe that is all I have at this time, um, but you know, I'll take questions at the end if there are any. Great, thank you, Dr. Morrison. Uh, again, just like I mentioned with uh, Wendy and Grand Traverse County, we uh, really appreciate all the hard work that you and your teams are doing. And again, appreciate you being available for these updates as you and your teams are um, continuing to be stretched very thin. So uh, now I'd like to uh, bring uh, the slide down and just bring our um, panelists back for the Q&A session. Um, as both Wendy and Dr. Morse mentioned, uh, the health departments are extremely busy right now. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Lisa Peacock, who usually joins us from the Benzie Lelanau uh, District uh, Health Department and the uh, Benzie Lelanau Health Department or Health Northwest Michigan Health Department uh, is not able to join us uh, today, uh, either is Heidi Britton, but we uh, will get to as many questions as we can with the panelists we do have. So first question is for Dr. Nefsi. 
This is coming from uh, one of our reporters. And the question is, uh, what is the age range of current uh, COVID-19 patients? And I assume this means in, in the hospital. Um, so let's start there. Is there. Are we seeing what you said uh, about the vaccination rates of the higher age group and the hospitalization rate sort of being an inverse relationship? Yep, we absolutely are seeing that. So just as a comparison, if you look at the average age of our hospitalizations from like the November to February surge, uh, that was in the 70s, and only about a third of the patients were under the age of 65. If you look just in the last, um, just March and April timeframe, uh, the average age is down to uh, 61 and over 60% of the patients are under the age of 65. So we have definitely seen um, a decrease in uh, age for those patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19. And then what is the average length of stay for those patients? I know that in the beginning of the pandemic, we heard a lot about people being on ventilators and having to possibly be hospitalized for a month um, stay. Is, is that still the case? Yeah, you know, the, with this uh, fall surge and this one, we've seen uh, far fewer patients uh, intubated. Part of that is just because we have a ch a changed our clinical approach to those as we've learned more about COVID-19. Um, so they are certainly sick enough uh, to be hospitalized and often sick enough to be in the ICU. Um, many of them have an oxygen requirement, but few of them are intubated. Um, so as a result of that, the um, length of stay has decreased from what we originally saw, but it's still around six to seven days for these patients. And um, a couple more questions from the same reporter. Do those patients have to test negative before being discharged from the hospital? They do not. Nope. Um, you know, people can test positive for a long time afterwards. So really, we make the assessment um, clinically of whether they can go home or not. It has nothing and to do with their ability to test positive or negative. Yeah. Right. And from what I remember, that has been consistent throughout the pandemic, even when the first yep. pandemic started. I remember when Munson Healthcare had the first COVID patient in and we worked closely with the health department uh, in that case to send that patient home to quarantine at home. So I, right. yeah, I agree that that has been a protocol since uh, since the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, could you one last question from the same reporter? Is there a specific wing or area of COVID-19 patients only in um, in our, and are only certain hospitals within Munson Healthcare still only treating COVID patients? Yeah, you know, when the pandemic started, that was our approach. Um, part of that was just uh, how little we knew about COVID-19, and in large part, that was because of the lack of PPE and in our attempt to use that wisely, um, you know, and, and conserve as much of it as we could. We did cohort those patients. We stopped that cohorting months ago. Um, you know, we in hospitals are used to taking care of lots of different patients with infectious disease, uh, whether it's uh, the coronavirus or an influenza virus or, you know, pick, pick yours. Um, so we have stopped cohorting a while ago and all of our inpatient hospitals do take uh, COVID positive patients. Um, you know, we still have some critical access hospitals versus tertiary medical centers. So the level of care um, really is what dictates where those patients go but we are no longer cohorting them by hospital or in a specific floor. Thank you, Dr. Nefsi. The next question uh, is for Dr. Morse, um, and it's related to the variants. You and Wendy both mentioned uh, that we're seeing the B117 variant uh, in our region. Uh, how are you seeing it? Is it different? Um, like, What are some of the differences that, that, that you are seeing or experiencing? I've heard that it's more uh, contagious, but can you address that, please? So uh, what we've seen, because you don't know it's the variant for sure until you get results back, which is usually a couple weeks later, but the pattern we have seen is just, it's like someone dropped a powder keg of COVID off in a location. So we're seeing an extremely rapidly evolving outbreak in locations or very rapid spread of COVID in locations. And we'll say that's likely the variant. Can we get samples? And we'll send samples off. And again, a couple weeks later, we'll find out, yes, that was the variant. And um, several of our variant cases have been from extremely large outbreaks. Um, but that has been the pattern. And again, given how we're seeing our numbers increasing regionally, 
you know, that to me is, is very consistent with how this variant spreads. It is just much more communicable and um, spreads much more easily. So if, if we are a bit more comfortable with gathering together or not wearing masks and then you throw in a, a virus that has uh, mutated so that it can spread a bit more easily. Those two things separately may not have been as major, but those two things together has really caused this wildfire spread. Um, and so it has been just an unfortunate combination. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Wendy, are you mm -hmm. uh, seeing the same thing in Grand Traverse County with the variant? Yeah, we've had far fewer number of cases detected so far in the variant. So it's, it's hard to, uh, I guess, make some of the, the generalized statements that she was just able to make, but I'm, I'm sure that is the case. So, you know, we did case investigations in the first two and they weren't necessarily connected to large outbreaks, but we are in the process of doing it on our most recent two identified. Okay, thank you, Wendy and Dr. Morris. Uh, Dr. Nefsi, this next question is for you. Um, how is the current increase in coronavirus cases affecting uh, healthcare providers in general? I think this is a nice question because it's just like, how are, how are people doing? It's, this has been a long ride um, for the frontline teams that are treating uh, these patients. Um, and specifically, is there any risk of hospitals being overwhelmed and needing to ration or prioritize care again? Well, you know, we, we've had a year to sort of um, prepare and get ready for these kinds of eventualities. Um, I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. If we look at uh, what happened in the UK um, and in Europe, certainly uh, there were hospital systems that were overwhelmed and adjustments that needed to be made. I think we've seen some um, adjustments recommended by the state as well as our health departments in an attempt to mitigate this surge. Certainly at the hospital level, we are re-looking at our pandemic level. And uh, with that, you know, it adjusts things like our visitor policy um, and whether we are uh, going into you know, certain meetings and starting classes and doing those different things. So um, absolutely it has impacted us. It remains to be seen uh, if further impact uh, will result from this. Um, so, you know, really, I can't um, emphasize enough the same thing that our health department's colleagues have been saying is that, you know, the importance of masking, the importance of getting the vaccine when you can, the importance of uh, cooperating with the health departments uh, when you are exposed and quarantining appropriately are all things that uh, we need to do together as a community to help so that we don't ever get to the point where we have to, um, you know, turn people away or um, stop doing surgeries or those things. We certainly hope um, that we won't have to get to that point. Thanks, Dr. Nessie. Uh, one more question for you. This was uh, related to a news story that was coming out of um, Southeastern Michigan today. Uh, what do you make of the state report that some Michiganders have died after being vac vaccinated um, and people actually contracting COVID-19 after being vaccinated? Well, you know, we've said all along, no vaccine is perfect. Um, you know, I think most of us in medicine were thrilled at the 95% efficacy rate uh, when these vaccines came out. Um, and when you think about, you know, the, the three and a half million, or, or sorry, uh, 2.3 million people in Michigan that have been vaccinated, and we've had 246 breakthrough cases. I mean, that, that is a far better than a 95% efficacy rate. Um, so, you know, we expected to have some of those cases. Um, the numbers are low, it remains to be seen. You know, obviously we're studying and looking at that very closely. We're tracking it as well, you know, with our employees and with our hospitalizations. But I think what that tells you on one hand is that this uh, vaccine works. Um, I think what it tells you on the other hand is that, you know, because we still have such a high uh, percentage of, of positivity in our communities. Now is not the time to say I'm vaccinated and therefore I can go back to like living like we did pre-COVID. You know, it's really, really essential um, given how high our percentage rate is in our community that we continue uh, to mask and social distance regardless of whether you are immunized or not. So, um, you know, that data is fairly preliminary. We are looking at it, but what we do know is at least 11 of those 246 cases were hospitalized and three of them died. I think it's important to understand too, they didn't die because of the vaccine. 
they died because of COVID-19. And uh, in those rare cases, you know, the vaccine did not uh, protect them. We are looking into why, whether those people had other health considerations that it could, could have impacted it. Again, this, this data is very preliminary, but we do know and have said all along, no vaccine is 100% effective. Um, so we knew that this was uh, certainly a possibility. I am um, happy that the, the efficacy of these vaccines so far looks as positive as it is. Um, but again, we are not out of this yet. It's really important that we stick to those mitigation factors um, and still get vaccinated uh, when you have the opportunity. Great, thank you, Dr. Nefsi. And, and just one last uh, related question for you. Why do we think Michigan is being hit so hard with this latest wave? You know, it's a good question. Um, I think mm -hmm. that our health department colleagues have um, you know, made the point that these um, variants that we're seeing are highly contagious, way more than um, what we were seeing originally. And so I think that, you know, when you look at our uh, relatively low numbers early on, and so how many uh, people in our population were still, still susceptible to this, um, added to the variant, added to, you know, the fact that we um, opened up um, both, um, you know, whether it's restaurants or high school sports or all of those kinds of things, those, those were kind of a combination all together uh, that led a little bit to the perfect storm. Um, you know, we, these are unvaccinated young people uh, who are sort of driving this um, surge. And, um, you know, that's about all we, we really know. I think, you know, some of the, these things will come out later when we're able to sort of take a 10,000 foot view overall. Um, but my best guess, and I, I would love for my health department colleagues to weigh in, is it's a combination of factors um, as, I, as I relay. Thanks, Dr. Nefsi, and, and I think that gets to our next set of questions here um, that we're, we're actually getting quite a few questions on um, the school districts and decisions related uh, to schools going virtual and that. So I would like um, both Dr. Morse and, and Wendy to be able to address what's happening um, in their regions at a, at a sort of a high level. You know, I know these are very difficult decisions to make. They're not made lightly. There's a lot of factors uh, to consider in there, but, um, you know, I'll start with Wendy. Wendy, can you just, um, you know, clarify um, what's happening in uh, Grand Traverse County with um, the virtual learning right now. Sure. Uh, so we have meetings uh, multiple times a week with the schools and in one of the meetings we're also um, joined by Dr. Nefsi and other pediatricians and, and medical directors in the region. Um, and so we've been monitoring very closely as our cases have gone up in the community in Grand Traverse County, but more importantly, as we talk to schools, we've been seeing, you know, more and more cases in middle and high school age uh, students. And with all the metrics increasing, uh, not only in the schools, but also in the community. So particularly uh, with the, the months and hospitalization rate um, and the trend of seeing uh, younger people being hospitalized in addition to the recommendations uh, from Governor Whitmer about schools going virtual after spring break and then the CDC and the state health department also um, recommending post spring break quarantines. Um, combine that all with a lot of unknowns in our community with the fact that we've had 43 school age cases within the last week. We're in the process of doing the contact tracing and case investigations. Um, all of that takes time. And we also know that there was a large testing event yesterday and that our testing site for the health department was also full today and tomorrow. And we know that sports testing started yesterday as well. So combine that all together and the school superintendents were really looking for direction on uh, how to proceed for this week. So we did give the direction yesterday that uh, they should go to uh, virtual learning for the rest of this week. Um, the virtual learning actually does uh, to some degree stop or prevent um, quarantines for some who might just be exposed to sitting next to a child at school. There's been a lot of frustration with parents um, over the school year with um, just their child happening to sit next to someone within that, you know, that six foot distance. And so, um, 
you know, we hope that during the next four days we'll be able to get uh, a clearer picture of uh, where specifically the cases are. Maybe we can narrow it down to some schools, but uh, for now we really needed that four days to focus on um, seeing whether or not the trends were going to continue to increase in school age kids or um, start to level off. Thank you, Wendy. And Dr. Morse, do you want to comment on what's happening in your district? <clears throat> so we have kind of left it on a school by school basis. So we have not recommended that they go virtual, but we support whatever decision they may make. Um, many of our schools, well, all of our schools are very rural and many of them do not do well with virtual um, because of internet access or just a wide variety of reasons. And so um, I meet with, I have 71 school districts through my 19 counties. And so I meet with them all once a week. And then our health officer, I know, talks to the different school districts more often throughout the week. And we're in frequent communication with them individually as they have questions. And so we've provided them with decision-making tools and all the information that they need regarding healthcare capacity and public health capacity. And then, um, you know, if, there were a public health reason we felt they needed to close, we would advise that, but mainly based on what they feel they need to do for the best education of their students. Um, so, you know, again, at this point, we did not advise them that they needed to go virtual, but again, some have chosen to do that based on what their caseload looked like or what their concerns were, or again, the concerns of their families and um, teachers, but um, we're just kind of working them through things at this point for a variety of different reasons. So thank you, Dr. Morse. Our decision. Yep. One, one other question uh, specifically uh, directed uh, to you and, and what's happening in your region. Um, what, uh, could you clarify uh, what you mean by there have been uh, far more variant cases than what you're actually able to report. I think you reported that there were 12 variant cases actually reported in, work, um, in the county right now at the start of the call. Can you just clarify your statement around that, please? Yeah, yeah, I guess that is a little confusing. Um, meaning that we can't test every single person for the variant. It's a very complicated process. We have to get an appropriate sample that's collected properly and send it to the state. Um, so just by looking at the dynamics of how the, the virus is behaving right now and the increases in cases, um, it's probably safe to assume that there's a large percentage of our cases that are caused by the variant. Um, we just can't test them all for the variant. So our assumption would be that probably 30 to 50% of them are likely caused by the variant. Again, that's just a guesstimate. Um, it's just that we can't, there's no quick and easy way to test for that. Um, and I think right now, lab testing is kind of suggesting that about 30% of the samples going to the state are caused, are the B117 variant. So again, it was just, um, that was what that comment meant, was just that okay. we can't send every single sample to the state to see if it is a variant. Um, but we have been trying to send quite a few from our outbreaks and um, at least a few from, from our larger outbreaks. And, you know, they have confirmed our suspicions that they were linked to the, they, they were due to the variant. So. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Meant. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. That's why, um, you know, these Q and A sessions are great because you can actually clarify uh, some of the statements there. Um, Dr. Nefsi, uh, two questions for you. Uh, one is, are we tracking or do we know how many uh, months in healthcare hospitalized patients are due to the variant right now? Yeah, we uh, don't know right now. I, I think as it was stated, it takes weeks often for the results on variant testing to come back. Um, we are sending uh, just a, a general uh, percentage of all of our positive tests to the state just as um, sort of surveillance testing. Um, but, you know, when we have a suspicion of a variant and send it in, it take a long time. So we don't have any real-time data about our current hospitalized patients and whether they're positive for the variant or not. Dr. Nefsi, uh, another question related to spring break. Um, you know, I know that 
when we were talking about the Thanksgiving holiday and uh, Christmas and, and that we were kind of expecting that there would be a bump in cases approximately two weeks after people began gathering. Are, are we expecting the same thing for spring break? And is that why this quarantine uh, recommendation from the CDC is so important right now? Yeah, I, I, yes. Um, okay. the, I think it's important to know that the CDC does recommend if you traveled, that you should test and quarantine upon your return from that travel. Um, even for people who are vaccinated and there is a lot more leeway if you are vaccinated, they are saying unless you were, you know, um, kept the safety measures in place of masking and, you know, um, not exposure to large crowds and all of that kind of stuff, you know, even then with those people, there would be a recommendation, but absolutely for unvaccinated people, the recommendation is to quarantine and test after you return. Um, so, you know, understanding there are logistics to that and that it can be difficult um, and school and work and all of those things. I mean, that's why the virtual option is a nice one, um, but that is absolutely the recommendation from the CDC. Thank you, Dr. Nefsi. Uh, this next question is for, uh, I'll send it over to Dr. Morse. Um, how long after being exposed will a tracing test come back positive? Is there any insight or clinical information on that? So it's the highest likelihood of a positive or the lowest likelihood of a negative is um, typically between the five to eight day range. Um, <clears throat> any sooner than that, you have a high likelihood of a negative test. However, you certainly can get tested sooner, um, but just know that if it's negative, it does not mean you're not infected. And same with if you're tested on day 13, if it's negative, it doesn't mean you weren't infected or that you aren't infected. Um, but when they've looked at the likelihood of positivity, it's highest, I want to say it was highest on day seven or eight, but it, it tends to be between that five to eight day range where it is the highest. So that's why we usually say to try to wait five to seven days to get tested. Okay, thank you very much. Obviously, if you have symptoms, you should get tested right away. <laughs> so. Right, right. Um, Dr. Nefsi, uh, can you address if someone has questions about the vaccine, um, spe very specific to their own healthcare condition? We're getting some questions in about um, whether or not someone should go and get a second dose of, of the vaccine uh, based on their current health condition. What would you recommend um, that, that people do? I think people have two options. My first recommendation would be talk to your healthcare provider. You know, um, all, all of our clinicians um, are trained in uh, vaccines and how they work, and uh, your primary care provider will know you and your health background better than anyone. So going to your primary care provider to have that conversation would be uh, step one. We also do have a, a nurse line um, with well-trained clinical people that can also uh, walk you through some of those questions, especially if they're a little bit more general. Great, thank you. And Dr. Nessie, can you also just touch on um, how Munson Healthcare is continuing to distribute and help distribute vaccines? Um, and, and specifically, do you have any updates on uh, the primary care or family doctor offices um, throughout Munson Healthcare? Yep, we continue to meet multiple times a week with our um, system-wide vaccine steering committee, and we have that meeting with our health department colleagues. And so as we receive vaccine, and again, we don't order it anymore, we kind of get what we get. Um, so we adjust when we get it, and uh, we are working with a number of clinics uh, throughout the region, both uh, not just our employed clinics, but um, some of the private practice clinics as well. Um, so we continue to distribute that vaccine to those clinics as well as to our health departments to aid in, um, you know, larger vaccine clinics. Um, we continue to um, vaccinate our employees as we bring new ones on or as we have other ones change their mind. Um, so that work is continuing um, and uh, we just anticipate uh, further coordination and collaboration in that regard. We are hearing that certain clinics are getting a vaccine directly allocated to them from the state as well. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a problem or not problem, it's a, a process that we work on um, on a daily uh, basis to ensure that we can get as much vaccine in arms in our Northern Michigan communities as possible. 
Great, thank you. And I just want to uh, take this time to thank all of our panelists. We actually did get through all of the uh, questions that came in uh, through the webinar and through Facebook uh, today. We will uh, continue to address questions as they come up um, throughout our communities and we will keep our FAQ section on our website updated uh, with the latest information that we have. I do want to also point out um, as we have with every press conference um, and we post this online as well, there are a variety of community resources that are available. Here are um, the contact information for all of the various health departments and health agencies throughout Michigan. Do want to also encourage people um, that that 211 Michigan line is still open and the Area Agency on Aging of Northwest Michigan is also a really great resource for, um, for those, especially the senior uh, hotline, if there are any seniors out there who um, have either changed their mind or weren't able to get vaccinated in the first round. So um, I want to thank um, all of our panelists today and especially thank you to our health department representatives for all their hard work and their partnership and collaboration with this. And, and Dr. Nefsi, your, uh, your clinical information and insights into the healthcare system is always invaluable. So I want to thank everyone again. Uh, we will plan to have another press conference to update you next week. And uh, again, I, conti I continue to uh, encourage you to sign up for the Munson Healthcare e-newsletter, follow us on social media, and visit munsonhealthcare.org. Thanks and have a great day.